as you know, GIST is not a single disease. Uh, that's the first thing we learned probably about 10, 12 years ago now, 15 years ago. So you have the more common wild type, more common adult GIST, which are the kit mutant or the PDGFRA mutant. So they form the bulk of the GIST. They're about 80%, 85% of the GIST are that. And then what we knew, or what you know now, is that the kit and PDGF alpha gist are mutually exclusive, meaning that you can get kit mutated gist or a PDGF alpha gist, but not both. Exceptions, we had one or two patients who defied the rule. They had two gist at the same time, two different mutations. That's an exception to the rule. And also you can only get one primary mutation, meaning that if you've got a kit exon level mutation, gastric gist or a small bowel gist, you're not going to get a kit exon 9 or a wild type gist, okay? But again, we had a young girl who had a HDS deficient gist, and sitting next to it was a kit mutation gist in the same specimen, but that is an exception to the rule. So generally, you get one mutation and one primary mutation and one type of gist. Other people were asking me whether what are the chances of my gist coming back in the area where he had the operation. In our experience, zero. Meaning, if you have a R0 resection, meaning the resection margins are clear, and a specialist gist surgeon has done the operation, the chance of your gist coming back in that area is zero. And do, would you develop another new gist somewhere down in the small bowel? If it's a normal, the usual adult kit or PDG for a mutant gist, you won't develop another gist. People ask me, what about having colonoscopies, having endoscopies? We don't do that because you're highly, highly unlikely to develop another new adult mutated gist as a new primary. Unlike, say, with breast cancer or lung cancer or bowel cancer, you can get lots of primaries over a period of time. It doesn't happen with the mutated gist. It can happen with the more, less common post-gist patients, but that's different. We'll come to that in a minute. Other thing they were asking is um, another question about, uh, I don't know my mutational status, my gist mutation said You have to go back, ask for it, because I put it in my letter, I think. In, so who's that? Um, I think all my patients, in my summary, what I do is I say molecular profile of the gist. So kit exon 11 mutation, code on 557, 558, deletion, insertion, do, 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 do. I do that. So that's important because it tells me how I'm going to judge the behavior of the gist. They depend on what mutation is. Is it a deletion, insertion, substitution, or deletion insertion? And where it is sitting in the gene, which bit of the gene actually is uh, knocked off, that also has a bearing on the prognosis, meaning how the gist is going to behave, and also has an kind of a hint how your drugs are going to work and what are the risks of developing secondary mutations over a period of time. So in my practice, what I do now is I look at the mutation and the patient has tumor resected, for example, six centimeter gastric gist, and this is the mutation. I can actually tailor my imaging, meaning the scans, to the mutation meaning instead of doing a scan every three months, six months, 12 months kind of thing, which is the standard protocol for all GIST, we tailor the frequency of scanning to the mutation. Again, this is not as yet made into the guidelines because we have not got data to support this. We're going to work with the Scandinavian sarcoma group. Uh, this guy called Heike Yehunsu is uh, He's the guy who ran the three versus five years adjuvant imatinib trial, and I was the CI chief investigator for UK. So what we are working with that group of patients who took part in the trial is whether we can tailor the, uh, the imaging frequency, meaning the scanning frequency, to the mutation. That will be a big advantage for us because we can cut down the number of scans, uh, cut down the radiation exposure, and also use the resources more efficiently. We can cut down the costs. Uh, that's the most important thing as well in the NHS. So that's the background, uh, lots of questions being asked kind of thing. Now we come to this pediatric adolescent wild type syndromic gist. So I'm the national lead for this. 
Number of patients per year in the country, one to 1.5 per million. So if you got 10 to 15 per million just as a whole in the country, about 600 to 900 patients, you're talking 1, 1 to 1.5 per million uh, pediatric wild type syndromic gist. And again, what we've learned in the last 10 years is that they're very heterogeneous, meaning that each subtype of post gist is different from the other subtype. So you have, say, five people sitting <coughs> here in, the, in this room with the label, I got a post gist, but all the five of them very, very different natural history, very different behavior, and also how the gist develop over a period of time. Next, please. A pub. <laughs> <laughs> but we, best ideas always come in a pub. Uh, that's Cambridge. Do you know what that pub is? Cambridge? It's that one there. Eagle, Eagle Pub. What is famous for? Beer, you know, yeah, kind of, yeah. But what's, why is there, why is there a blue, blue plaque? And you can't see it. Deliberately, I, I'm, I mean, it's where Watson and Crick, uh, they were chatting about the DNA. So that's where, so that's the reason why that pub is famous. What is this one? This is the, you remember very well. So Jane remembers very well. We were there in this pub in 2011, 11? 11. 11, in Victoria Arms Pub in Master Motel in uh, Oxford, Master in Oxford. So that's where the idea of a post gist was born, to try and see what can we can do for this rare subgroup of gist patients. And we had food, wine, lunch, and then a lot of wine, and then we came. Yeah. Yes, in fact, that was the, where we couldn't work out what it, how to call this because we didn't. I didn't like the, time, the title "wild type," meaning as in, or something which is it not like non, non, non something, non kit, non pediatric. We won't have a name, so we like the acronym "pause" kind of thing. It's actually a very kind of a catchy thing, and also it sat very well with the description. It's a pediatric, adolescent. We did have the wild type because at the time we were still using wild type as a description. And then syndromic, meaning that it can be part of a syndrome of two or three other diseases combined kind of thing. So that actually is what we use. Americans use a different uh, phrase or different term, but we are happy with that one. Next, please. So that went from there, I ended up in uh, Bethesda at the National Institute of Health because Americans already had a uh, wild type gist clinic at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda in Maryland, which is out next door to Washington, D.C. So these are the guys who have been doing the clinic for a while, and um, he was the leader at the time, and um, Jonathan Trent is from uh, Miami, Susan George is from uh, Dana Farber in Boston. He's the guy who had a syndrome named after him, uh, Stratakis. Uh, Carney Stratakis. Carney was older guy, but Stratakis' name was added to one of the syndromes. And the wee, tiny, mini guy behind is me. Um, so I was completely, um, I had no idea. I mean, I went there, I sat with them for three days, and looked at the way the clinic is done uh, in America. And they had this thing, they have pizzas uh, the evening before. I said, well, that's interesting. Uh, lots of pizzas. So I said, okay, that's a good idea. So they meet up with the patients and the families before, and then next day they see the specialist. You know, they, it's a very detailed consultation, and before the clinic, all the information is sent to the team at the NIH. And then the patients go back to their local oncologist, and then if they're in trials and everything, this is, we're talking 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, so when there were no trials. But the important thing was data collection, setting up a database, 
collecting the data, learning more about the disease. Next, please. So that's the consortium members. Uh, Robin, Palmer, Charlotte, Olive Geiger is our uh, gist pathologist. Ruth is very cr crucial because she's the one who does all the trials. Brain behind me. I'm the pretty face and she's the brain. Uh, Iman Mahir is our genetics professor. He's got a wealth of experience in SDH deficient gist. And obviously Jane, without Jane wouldn't have been here. Uh, driving force behind all of us. Literally is flogging us, you know, <laughs> till we fall off. Uh, but that's her. Right, next please. So this is the website. Next. The so patients registered online to the clinic. So you, some of you have seen the uh, form. The form is now looks different, uh, but same form. And they submit the details and come to us. And it comes to my NHS.at email address. And then we contact the surgeon, oncologist, who is actually looking after the patient. Next, please. And we also have a social site to the clinic as well. We again end up in a pub the night before. Uh, the next clinic is on the 21st of April, which is week today. So the evening before, we end up in a pub. This time, we are ending up in an Italian restaurant. Um, so we have a meal, have a chat with the patients and the families so that they understand that we are human beings. We're not people with three horns, three eyes, five ears, that kind of thing. So we're normal people. And then that gives you a bit of a relaxed atmosphere the next day when they come to see us in the clinic in the sense that, oh, we're fine. You know, these are guys, we are chat with him. He was doing this all the time. You know, that's okay. You know, so next one. Yeah. So what did we see so far is that just over 100 patients so far, and uh, what is striking is this ratio. There are more women, females than men. Uh, when you say, why is it interesting? Because in the adult mutated gist, the kit is one to one. So r roughly about one to one, one point one to one. So this is strikingly women or female dominant much younger compared to your adult type of gists. And these are the four broad subtypes we have seen. The most um, common or most frequent subtype is the SDH succinate dehydrogenase deficient. You don't have to memorize that. Uh, then this funny term called quadruple negative, what it means is that there are no mutations in KIT, no mutations in PDGF for alpha, no mutations in BRAF, which is another kinase, and the SDH is actually proficient, meaning that SDH is intact. So it's a funny way of describing something is quadruple negative. You could have a name for it, but we don't have a name. And more recently, also there's something called quintuple negative, meaning that negative for five things. We keep on adding those quadruple, quintuple, sextuple, which is not the right way to describe things, but that's where we are. This is a challenging subgroup of post gist NF stands for neurofibromatosis. So neurofibromatosis is where you see nerve sheath or nerve-related tumors. And they also have uh, subcutaneous uh, nerve tumors in the, under the skin. And they may also have nerve tumors uh, in different parts of the body. About 7 to 10% of um, patients with NF1 which is a genetic abnormality, they also develop gists. And those gists do not have mutations in the kit or PDGF alpha. Again, there are exceptions to that. There are case reports where a patient with NF1 had a kit mutant gist, so you always check for that. Interestingly, we actually found out in the clinic that about 7% of our patients actually had kit mutations or PDGF or alpha mutations, though they were labeled as wild type. The reason for that is when the tumor was tested, they were using the old fashioned sequencing for testing the mutations. Now with the new technique we have with the next generation sequencing, more in-depth sequencing, we were able to pick up mutations which weren't there, which weren't picked up on the previous uh, testing platform. So that's another reason why when somebody comes with the wild type just to the clinic, we always recheck. Uh, if it was done five years ago, 10 years ago, we recheck. 7% of the patients who attended the clinic, we found out that they were not wild type at all. They actually had a kit 
or a PDG of our permutation. Uh, that makes the prognosis and the management completely different to a wild type gist. Next, please. So this is the age distribution for all the patients, and this includes the NF1 quadruple negative. But if you look at the SDS deficient gist patients, it's more towards the younger age group. So majority of the patients are under the age of 40. We had a, only about a couple of patients who were in that age group where you see normal gists, adult gists. So majority of the patients are around this. Uh, uh, this is when they were diagnosed, not when they attended the clinic, but when they were diagnosed. Next, please. And so half the patients who attended the clinic uh, had STS deficient gist. Roughly about quarter were NF1. Then about this one is seven percent. This thirteen percent is uh, the quadruple negative. Um, yep, yeah, quadruple negative. So next, please. We have not found any NTRAC fusion just in the clinic. NTRAC is a, a fusion oncogene. Um, it's present in lung cancer, <coughs> salivary gland tumors, infantile fibrosarcoma, and I got one NTRAC just patient. I thought before I retired, I went to find one. I found one. Um, so NTRAX just are they're there. Um, the reason why we may have not diagnosed them in the past is because we were primarily doing DNA sequencing on our um, uh, when we were testing for mutations in different genes. Now we have added a RNA platform. I think from what I understand, RNA platform is far, far superior compared to DNA platform for picking up the N-track gist. So we'll probably find more, uh, but we've got one at the moment. So going back to the post gist, what has happened to these patients? Quite a lot of them have been treated with um, the conventional uh, treatments we use for adult kit mutant gist, imatinib, sunitinib, ragrafenib. What is the challenge is that the imatinib doesn't work very well. In fact, doesn't work, full stop. And we kind of believe that, oh, imatinib is holding the disease stable for a number of months, when in fact it was the behavior of the tumor. The tumor actually was either not growing or slowly growing. So we felt that it was imatinib what was doing it, but it wasn't. It's just what we call the biology of the disease. So imatinib highly unlikely to work in post-gist patients. We had one response, documented response, for just about two to three months, uh, and the disease progressed again. So that is an exception to the rule. But generally, imatinib doesn't work. Sunitinib has some activity, but most of the activity we have seen is with ragrafenib. So ragrafenib seems to be active in especially STH deficient gists. The NF1 gist, they are not sensitive to any of the known kinase inhibitors as yet. So even the, there's not much data on avapritinib, not much data on ripritinib, but knowing the mechanism of action, mm -hmm. we don't expect NF1 gist to respond to any of the kinase inhibitors we have so far. That's a holy grail um, to find a drug or a treatment, effective treatment for NF1, just as holy grail. And one of the things we are hoping to do this year, which we couldn't do because of the COVID and everything, is to link up with Manchester and London and ourselves, because both Manchester and London have a big NF1 specialist centers. So we can actually link up with the NF1 center in Manchester, NF1 center in London, and ourselves with the GIST center as a post-GIST to try and find out what, why it happens in NF1 patients. We already had some discussions with that um, patient support group, didn't we? They call something else now, tumor, nerve tumor society. Yeah, nerve tumor UK. So we had some discussions with them. The research there is to go back to the basics. Look at the NF1 gene, it's a very big gene. Mm -hmm. Look at the NF1 gene, see where is the mutation in the NF gene causing the NF1 syndrome, mm -hmm. and try and see whether we can pick up that group of patients 
where they're developing gist. So there might be different mutations in different parts of the gene. Perhaps maybe only one part of the gene which is mutated will give rise to gist, not the other mutations. So if we can find out that and we can confirm it, that means we can focus our surveillance to that group of NF1 patients, not the whole NF1 patients. Other peculiar thing about NF1 is they tend to be multifocal, meaning they can have multiple gists, either all at the same time or over a period of time. So somebody can have a small bowel gist and you take it out. And uh, when you open them up, sometimes you see tiny dots around the small bowel and there are tiny, tiny gists. In somebody's lifetime, nothing may happen to them. They may be sitting there for years and years, but sometimes they grow, they bleed, and you take them out. And we got patients who had two or three operations over a 10, 15 year period in the post gist clinic. So that's the difference between kit mutant gist and NF1 gist. Kit mutant gist, you only got one gist in your lifetime, primary gist. These ones, you can get multiple gist over a period of time or all at the same time. And you only pick up and take people, things out if they are bleeding or causing problems. Don't keep taking the whole bowel out. You don't do that. Three patients had selective internal radiotherapy uh, for liver secondaries. And four had conventional radiotherapy. Two patients, we had to embolize the, uh, either the tumor or the liver secondary because they were causing pain or bleeding. This is the challenge. Only four patients actually had gone to some clinical trials and none of them were actually specific to GIST. They were what we call as the early phase all commerce trials kind of thing. So that's a phase one trial. So this is where we want to improve the situation and tailor it to the GIST patients. Yes, please. So I'm not tired of using this word because I've been using this word for a long time now, collaboration. Uh, I think in rare cancers, especially with GIST, you have to collaborate. The numbers are small. Individually, we can't do anything, but collectively, we can generate enough numbers to do a trial. So we got a tumor bank, we got a registry, and uh, we got cell line work going on in Nottingham and Sheffield. I think it is fair to say that we understand the biology better now, say compared to about 10 years ago. Uh, we know what is happening with STS deficient gist, what is the mechanism. We know what happens in NF1 gists. Quadruple negative uh, is a bit of black hole, we're not sure. And um, the others, work in progress kind of thing. Next, please. So this is all Ruth and Olivier doing the work and some of this already published. I got no idea. Next, please. <laughs> I can talk about it, but I'm not the person. Ruth, this is Ruth's trial, Ruth Casey's trial. Ignore all the gobbledook here. What it is is that the STH deficient just express a protein on the cell surface and um, this protein is called gastrin releasing peptide receptor and um, this is primarily to do with the neuroendocrine tumors which is a different type of rare cancer in the gut and what Ruth and her colleagues have found out is that some of the just express this particular receptor uh, like a kind of, like a kit kit receptor for example same thing but a different type of receptor on the cell surface and um, it so happens that there is a radio labeled antibody which you can deliver to the tumor cells and that means you're actually delivering radiation targeting into the tumor cell so we just treated the first patient we had some uh, logistic problems because of um, some contamination of the radio pharmacy. So the whole thing was shut down. The trial was supposed to start last summer. Uh, took a while to clear it up and the first patient was treated just about a month ago. So they have a diagnostic phase, meaning the patients come in to get tested to see whether the tumor takes up the this particular, uh, oops, ah, there. Uh, this particular compound and then they go to a therapeutic phase 
So if you're negative on the diagnostic phase, you don't take part in the trial. You just come off. Um, this is an ongoing trial, not just for GIST, but any tumor which expresses this particular protein. Next, please. So there's already a lot of data on this SIRT, slide out of sequence, the trial, the slides. So yttrium is the radio-labeled antibody uh, we use for liver metastasis. So far, seven patients with SDH deficient just have been treated, three in UK, three in America, and one in Germany. And um, we've been linking up with them to try and get the manuscript out for publication, because without publication, you can't say, go back to the authorities and say, can you fund this, please? So the publication thing is important. What we've learned with our three patients is that all the three patients are in very good partial remission or near complete remission. Um, the one girl, she is now four and a half years into follow-up. She was treated in 2018. The other girl was treated in 2019. October 31st, yep. She's now three and a half years into follow-up and she's having an MRI scan done this week. And the last MRI scan of the liver showed not much. They shared something like 35, 40 liver secondaries and there was nothing there to see, hardly anything. It was a one-off treatment. She went to Liverpool for the treatment. Third patient was treated in 2021 and she had post procedure um, uh, radiation related cholecystitis meaning inflammation of the gallbladder and the gallbladder has to be taken out uh, but scan done earlier this month March March it was shown there was a very good remission we could only treat the right side of the liver not the left side of the liver because she had so many secondaries so the right side of the liver is completely nearly gone the left side is stable. So this is something which is completely new to us in the sense that this came as a chance f treatment because we, myself and uh, Professor Judson and also the guy in Liverpool, Dr. Lassim Ali, we came across a paper which was highlighting that SDS deficient tumors as a whole are sensitive to radiation they cannot handle DNA damage. What does it mean in simple English? That means if you use a treatment which is DNA damaging, meaning it, it damages the DNA inside the tumor, they can't replicate. And the most powerful DNA damaging drug we know or intervention is radiation. Radiation causes breaks in the single strand and double strands of the DNA and then if you can't repair the damage, the cells die. And that's what we have seen. So if you want to look at GIST, STH deficient as a completely different type of disease, don't use the word GIST, but say STH deficient cancer, you've got things opening up. So one of the things is the yttrium labeled selective internal radiotherapy. Does this work in normal, more adult type of GIST? Less likely because the data from a guy called Peter Hohenberger from Germany, it showed that it does have temporary stabilization, but not the kind of a dramatic benefit we have seen as stage deficient gist. Um, so next please. This is hot of the press. Um, basically, again, serendipity in the sense that I was talking to one of the neuroendocrine tumor guys and then he, he also treat pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas which are uh, neural tumors which may be linked to the uh, STH deficient gist. And they have a trial, they're looking at it uh, with this new drug which is already actually licensed in America and it has a fast track approval by MHRA for one condition which is an extremely rare condition called von hippel lindau disease, BHL, which is a very, very rare genetic condition. People get kidney cancers and everything. For that condition, the drug is already has approval. So this trial is a multi 
arm trial, and one of the arms is they were specifically looking for SDS deficient gist patients. And the company which makes the drug, they say, oh, we can't find them, very difficult to find them, no, it's going to be challenging. We just put our hand up and say, we've got patients here. You know, right now I can give you at least 10, 15 patients. They need about 15, 20 patients. So this is a tablet treatment. And what it does is it targets this particular uh, protein, hypoxia-inducing factor alpha-2. I won't go into details because you're already dozing off. If I go into this, you'll be completely moribund, I'm telling you. <laughs> really. So, but if alpha-2 is upregulated in SDS deficient just because of what happens prior to that, and that is a druggable target. It's been a challenge because the previous drugs which we were using to target HIF alpha were very toxic. So they never made it to the clinic. They were there, but they never made it into a trial like this. So this is a phase two trial, looking at the efficacy, and also the collection data on the toxicity as well. And we just submitted the, um, our, um, not expression of interest, but confirming that we are actually a site, because we already site for other arms of the trial. So hopefully this trial will be starting very soon uh, with this new drug. We are quite excited about it. I'm not showing it in my face because <laughs> I'm a bit nervous. Uh, I'm hoping that it will go online very quickly, and then we have patients who actually can take part in the study. It will be first of its kind anywhere in the world for STH deficient gist. Next, please. So this is what is called an elephantine gestation. <laughs> We've been sitting on this for years. The journey to publish this paper started before the pandemic. Uh, and the pandemic did scupper a lot of things. And what we're hoping to do with the help of uh, Post-Gist Consortium and Gist Cancer UK is get a position paper, meaning what do we want to happen to these patients? How do we manage these patients? What are the recommendations? What are the guidelines? What is the evidence so far? And what, where, where, where we go from here? So that is what means by position paper. And also a platform for actually to engage with the national and inter international researchers so that we can actually say, this is what we want to do and we want to go as a group, as a, a collaborative group. So my Sincere hope at Jane is that we want to get this paper out soon, soon meaning in the next month, hopefully. We're nearly there. Yeah, we're nearly there. I think we managed to trim quite a bit. It was 70, 80 page document, and then we are cutting it down to um, uh, manageable. And so we're trying to get it down to uh, what was a publishable manuscript uh, and making sure that actually it gets into publication. So this is, would be an important milestone for us in the post just uh, sort of a consortium uh, in the, uh, yeah, next one please. So this happened just about a week, two weeks ago. Um, so there is an organization called International Rare Cancers Initiative and they were asking for expression of interest. I think I got an email from you, didn't I? Yeah, and then, um, hmm, interesting. What does it mean? Uh, they don't provide any financial support or anything, what they do is they open doors, I think, that's what I heard. And what I see in the thing is they open doors. And we are already part of the International Consortium for SDS Deficient Gist. So the consortium has members in UK, in Europe, in North America. So we formed the consortium back in 2018 in Miami when we met one of the GIST meetings. And this hopefully will serve as a platform to get a, a trial. At the moment, it's a drawing board stage. This is the trial we want to think about, a chemotherapy drug plus a drug which damages the DNA uh, repair. So this does DNA damage. This stops the repair. So you got DNA damage done by a chemotherapy drug tablet, then followed by a drug which actually 
stop the tumor cells repairing the damage. You say that's win-win, but you have to remember the toxicity to the normal cells as well, so you need to be careful. But this is in the drawing board stage. It may take a long time. Long way to go. Next, please. So, this is the important thing, collaboration. Um, doesn't matter where you are, you need to link up with like-minded teams elsewhere. That is the UK, Europe, America, elsewhere. Without this, it won't happen. It will never happen because in the rare cancers, uh, especially in rare cancers, if you hunt the patient advocacy group with you or behind you or supporting you, doesn't matter how clever research you are, it's not good. The other thing is this bit. No point in doing a trial because you found a target and then you got a trial and you got recruited 10 patients, but it's of no use to the patient because it didn't lead to a drug. Okay, it's okay, fine, understand the biology. But for me, this is the most important thing to get the patients have a say in the trial, how to design it, what are the outcomes you want to measure, is it going to be beneficial to the patient community. We are optimistic. I'm a Sagittarian. Uh, Sagittarians are very optimistic people. Glass is always half full. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. I think it's the patients. Sometimes we get frustrated because we've got lots of ideas coming through, but they don't translate into a trial. That's been happening for about eight or 10 years now since we started the clinic. And the COVID really compromised a lot of things we wanted to do. But first time I can say that we got a SDH deficient gist specific trial, number one. Number two, we got a selective internal radiotherapy, which is specific for SDH deficient gist, which we didn't have before. And number three, the International Research Con uh, Rare Cancer Consortium initiative, if it comes through and we are selected as one of the groups, that opens up the doors. I think I'll stop there. I think my biggest achievement today is that I kept people completely awake, I think. <laughs> I was very worried that people would doze off post-lunch. I'll stop. <laughs>